right, guys. So last week, we covered the conclusion of the Depp Heard trial. Yes. And as she does, uh, Taylor Lorenz of the Washington Post had to put her take on what all of this meant. What she decided to focus on was the content creators who covered the trial and who got a lot of views and did very well because there was a lot of public interest mm -hmm. in the trial and it was not really covered extensively in the mainstream media. Taylor decided this was somehow really nefarious. Oh, okay. So not mm -hmm. only does she do this in her column, but then she has to lie about having reached out to some of these content creators uh, for comment and saying, well, they didn't respond. When in reality, she had just never bothered to reach out to them whatsoever. In the end, the Washington Post has to issue this long, at first it was called a correction, then they it was so lengthy, they had to turn it into an editor's note about how, oh, we said we reached out, but we really didn't, and actually we reached out to this one on social media and they didn't get back to us. Okay, so all of that being said, we decided to have one of those content creators on to tell her side of the story here after being smeared and lied about by Taylor Lawrence in the Washington Post. Um, Alita Majeka is uh, a content creator on YouTube. Her channel is called Legal Bites. She does legal analysis. Go ahead and put uh, her channel up on the screen there. She does all sorts of legal analysis, including uh, extensive coverage of the Depp Heard trial, and she joins us now. Great to meet you, Alita. Yeah, good to see you. Hi, so nice to meet you guys. Absolutely. Yeah, of course. Listen, before we get into the Taylor stuff, I'd just love for you to set up, you know, your conception of your channel and what you're doing over there. Because one of the things that, there were a lot of things that sort of irritated me about um, the framing from Taylor. But one of the things that irritated me is she seemed to indicate that you would like completely switch your channel around to cover this trial. When in reality, I mean, your channel is focused on legal issues. So it seemed to me like it was a very natural fit that you would lean into something that had obviously a lot of public attention. So why don't you go ahead and set that up for us, Alita? Thank you. Yeah, I started the channel around two years ago. I'm a licensed attorney. Um, I'm licensed in California and DC. And the whole point of this channel is to explain the law one bite at a time. That's always been the uh, the 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 motto, if you will, of the channel. And that's what I do. I, I take current events, pop culture, et cetera, and I break down the law so that people can understand it in more digestible kind of bite-sized ways. Well, that's great. And I think that people need that. And the attack, Alita, on you by Taylor appeared to be that you were somehow grifting by focusing and covering this uh, trial. So first of all, maybe just tell us like, how you decided to start covering the trial. I mean, obviously there was a, sh a ton of public interest and you were filling a niche, something that you know we happen to do over here. I don't think that that's a crime either, but tell us about how you kind of came to the trial, decided to start covering it, and then we'll get into what the exact post said about you. Yeah, so this wasn't the first time that I've uh, live streamed a trial, at least, well, this is the first time on my channel, but the first one was the Kyle Rittenhouse trial, which was over on Rakeda Law's channel. He invited mm -hmm. a bunch of us YouTube lawyers onto his channel to basically do exactly the same thing, to live stream it from gavel to gavel, give our commentary, give our thoughts, the good, the bad, the ugly, and basically go from, from there. So I had that experience already. And when I came across this case, it was maybe about a month before the trial began. And I was very interested in not only just the fa the underlying facts of the case were very interesting, but I also saw a community that was very, very skeptical and, and not trusting of the mainstream media because of its um, treatment of this case already from for years. Years, mm -hmm. people had been frustrated with the media's treatment of the case. So I figured this was a very interesting case to take a look at. I wanted to look at it myself, not rely on the headlines because I had learned from the Rittenhouse trial seeing for myself what the trial was like and then seeing what the headlines were like coming out of that and that there was a vast difference from what they saw versus what I saw. So I wanted to cover it from gavel to gavel on my channel with a bunch of other YouTube lawyers and other professionals, by the way. I had a nurse, I had two psychologists, I had a behavioral analyst, I had a bunch of people on the channel to basically give their, their takes from a professional and personal perspective. Um, and so that was what I decided that I wanted to do. I started covering it three weeks to a month before the trial began, long before it was ever clear that it was going to become like this global phenomenon that it became. Wow. Yeah, and you know what? Even if you had realized there was this need and then jumped on it once it already, that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. And what really bothered me why this piece particularly stuck in my craw, so to speak, is because she makes this whole point about how YouTubers don't, you know, they don't have to abide by journalistic ethics and they're just, the whole point is like, oh, they're just chasing the money. 
as if the mainstream press doesn't have their own incentives and money-making ventures um, backing them. And also, ironically, in this piece that's in part about how YouTubers don't have journalistic ethics, Taylor Lorenz herself violates journalistic ethics by lying about whether or not she reached out to com for comment um, to you and another content creator. So talk to us through that part of the story from your perspective. So what happened was I, I saw that she had she had published the article. And to be honest, I wasn't following her. I was vaguely familiar with her before this, but not really only just surrounding some sort of vague, I guess, uh, controversies, you could say. Mm -hmm. But other than that, I really didn't know one thing about her beyond that. Didn't really have too many opinions about her, to be honest. Um, but somebody had tagged me on Twitter and said, hey, you've got an article that's about you and it's not great. And this had already happened a couple of times. People have been talking about LawTube, so to speak, um, and other content creators in the context of this trial. So I was like, okay, you know, more shade, whatever. But I, I took a look at it and I saw that she had, she said that she had reached out for comment. And I was like, I mean, I've gotten a lot of emails in the last couple of months. Like things have been pretty crazy, but let me, let me double check my email just to see if she, like other journalists reached out to me. I, I looked for her first name, her last name, Washington Post. I saw nothing. There was nothing in my email indicating any kind of, of professional that was reaching out to me for comment. So I tweeted about it and I said, you know, I, I don't think this is accurate, mm -hmm. but you know, okay. Um, and then I saw that the other content creator that was um, in the same paragraph as me, that umbrella guy, you know, he and I follow each other also, cause he's been, he's been one of the most active and most prominent in the justice for Johnny Depp community for years. Um, and so he said the same thing. So I was like, okay, so <laughs> it's not just me. I'm not missing something. So then I get a direct message from her on Twitter saying, hey, I'm so sorry. Here's my phone number. You can reach out to me. And I was like, okay, well, you, 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 referenced, you referenced the information that you got about me from this Business Insider article. That article also mentioned that I'm living overseas. So it feels very disingenuous for you, for you to give me your phone number for me to reach out to you if you know that I'm overseas, because obviously you have definitely read that article if you're referencing it. Right. Um, so, so then I guess about 10 minutes later, she also DM'd my, my Instagram uh, account as well. Huh. So several iterations of corrections later, then I see, um, well, I guess before that, one of the first corrections was, I guess, the, the stealth edit of removing that parenthetical saying that she had reached out to us. And then there was the correction, of course, that said, you know, we removed that parenthetical, there was an error, blah, blah, blah. And then there was another correction after that saying, well, we didn't reach out to that umbrella guy, but we did reach out to Alita Majeka for, you know, through Instagram. When that was actually the last place where, where she tried to reach out to me mm. after she had reached out on Twitter privately after I had already called her out. So that we have ridiculous. we have yeah. um, your tweet, guys. Go ahead and put this up on the screen um, that has this final editor's note. And you say, what? At Washington Post, I will say this again. I was not reached out to by Taylor Runs for comment until after my tweet below. She reached out to me by Instagram DM after she did on Twitter. Both DMs were sent to me after I called her out here. Please stop lying and take the L. And I'll just read the editor's note here so people can see how extensive this is. And I want to make sure that, that I have the timeline right here too, Alita. So first, they just, once you guys call them out, they just sort of stealth delete the we reached out to them for comment, which violates right. their own standards. They realize they violated their own standards and this is becoming a thing. Then they issue this uh, correction, which then they make into an editor's note, which still is not correct. What it says is the first published version of the story stated incorrectly that internet influencers Alina Majeka and that umbrella guy had been contacted for comment before publication. In fact, only Majeka was asked via Instagram. And you say that's not true. After the story was published, the Post continued to see comment from Majeka via social media and queried that umbrella guy for the first time. During that process, the Post removed the incorrect statement but didn't note its removal. That's a violation of our corrections policy. So this turned out to a complete mess. You know, I mean— Listen, why is it worth like sort of going into the details of the, you know, the life of the story and the various corrections that were issued? What do you think is the broader point here, Alita? Well, I mean, as you mentioned before, it, it is ironic that this whole point of this article was to say how mainstream media is no longer being being turned to by the people because you know you have you have these 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 influencers on TikTok and on YouTube who are suddenly pivoting their content to make a buck. They're clout chasing, they're trying, they're just covering this because they want to increase their followers, increase their subscribers. 
that kind of stuff. And that and the the subtext seems to be that this is dangerous because misinformation is a big deal. And who's there to fact check these 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 dangerous influencers? Um, when in reality, <laughs> I'm I'm just asking for fair reporting on this right. thing. And and the truth of the matter is that when it comes to my followers, when it comes to me making any kind of a factual assertion um, to my followers and my subscribers, I have a community that is actually very well versed in the underlying facts. So if I get something wrong, they call me out on it. So I would expect nothing less than of of someone who is purporting to be someone who is a guardian of misinformation as well. Cable news is ripping us apart, dividing the country, making it impossible to function as a society, and making it impossible to know just what is true and what is false. But the good news is they are failing and they know it. That is why we're building something new, a new mainstream, a healthier one, something more trustworthy, something that we are going to need in one of the most pivotal times in American history. We are building up here for the midterms, for the upcoming presidential election, but we need your help. So if you can help us out by becoming a premium member today at breakingpoints.com, we're trying to change America for the better and the entire world. So what are you waiting for, guys? Go to breakingpoints.com and sign up and help us build a new mainstream.